All right, well, I am so excited to see many of you back for part two of this webinar, Industry Highlights from Q1. Uh, we, because of the overwhelmingly positive feedback from the first one, we've decided to keep doing this. Uh, we're gonna make this a series, um, but we're going to have a lot more guest speakers come on. Um, so if you have any ideas for people you want to invite, uh, we would love to help reach out and get them on this show. Um, we're also doing in-person events. So we're starting our first in-person event in South San Francisco um, at the Lighthouse Cafe on June 2nd. So uh, if you RSVP'd earlier, you should, uh, you should be seeing invites come to you individually. Uh, we have limited capacity there. So uh, we're just waiting for RSVPs before we open spots. But if you're interested um, and we missed you, please, please let me know. Um, I'll also be in Boston in October. Um, I'll be hosting a symposium at the AAPS. And after that, we'll have a drug hunter after party. Um, and we'll likely be looking at a place in Kendall Square. So if anybody's in the Cambridge or Boston area, would love to see you there. Uh, finally, I'll also be doing a trip to uh, Chicago uh, for ACS. So if anybody's there over the summer, it'd be nice to meet in person. Um, so I'll be passing the mic on to other speakers after this. I'm really excited that one of our next speakers is going to be Kate Jackson, Senior Director of Chemistry at C4 Therapeutics, talking about their BRD9 degrader program. Um, she gave a really great talk at AACR and one of our readers, Ingo Harton, head of, chemist, head of medicinal chemistry at Merck, said her lecture was excellent. We should really get her um, on here. And we're really lucky that she agreed to give a talk for us. So, um, stay tuned for that. It's on June 22nd or June 29th. We also have uh, Andrew Wilkes uh, coming later in the summer. Uh, he was the discoverer of the Jack enzymes, and he and his business partner, Chris Burns, have a great story on the discovery of the recently approved drug mumilotinib at Cytopia. And uh, Professor Silverman is also in the queue telling us about uh, neurodrugs beyond Lyrica. Um, and Chris Camp will be telling us about strategies to improve half-life and drug discovery. So if you're registered for the series, you should automatically get invites to those, but stay tuned for, for that. Okay, in this section, we'll be talking about IPOs, new companies, technologies and modalities, uh, and some clinical data. I'm going to apologize in advance. There are not going to be as many structures here for the chemists. We're mostly going to be talking about, you know, assay technologies or uh, general themes, targets, things like that, um, mainly because at this stage, many companies don't disclose their structures or their programs yet. But hopefully, you'll still find this as interesting as I did. A uh, quick background. Um, everybody knows that biotech has been in a massive bear market over the last year. So since the peak in February of last year, the entire biotech index is down over 50%. Uh, to put this in more context, of, well, number one of how hot it was over the last two years, there were almost 100 IPOs for drug discovery companies. So that's specifically people doing small molecule, large molecule, or cell therapy, you know, drugs. Um, which is, you know, a huge number. Um, I mean, there was a huge slowdown, and in this first quarter, there were only six. Um, of those six, there were four with small molecule programs, and I'll just quickly run through these to give you a flavor of kind of what's coming public. The first one, AN2 on the left, uh, they have an oral uh, boron-based drug, a petroboral, for non-tuberculosis mycobacterial lung disease. I thought it was interesting to see that actually one of the public companies and one of the higher valued companies actually uh, is working on infectious diseases. Um, uh, but it's an interesting mechanism. So the molecule uh, traps uh, bacterial leucyl tRNA to the RNA synthetase in stopping protein production. And they have a nice name for this, the oxyboral tRNA trapping mechanism or OBORT. I thought that was cute. Um, some interesting history here is this molecule actually was an Anacor asset before Anacor was acquired by Pfizer. And so this was uh, taken back by AN2, hence the name, I guess uh, it's the revival of Anacor. And their CEO is the former head of drug discovery at, uh, at Anacor. Uh, Nubectus presented at AACR on their NXP 800 program. It was, a phenotypic, it was from a phenotypic screen. Um, against the HSF-1 pathway. They also have a kinase inhibitor. Both of these programs were in-licensed from academia. So I thought 
uh, that was kind of interesting. Um, Syncor also is taking an in-licensed asset, uh, except this one is from industry, from Roche. They have an oral aldosterone synthetase, uh, synthase inhibitor, um, which is selected for CYP11B2, sparing CYP11B1, uh, which is involved in cortisol synthesis. Uh, the molecule appears to be safe in phase one, and they're moving into hypertension. And you know, with this former Roche molecule, they were able to raise $200 million uh, in their IPO. So that's quite a, quite a valuable program. Vigil took Amgen's TREM2 programs after uh, Amgen shut down neuroscience, unfortunately. Uh, TREM2 is this uh, important signaling molecule for microglia. Uh, microglia are white blood cells that sort of they're the nurses for neurons, and so microglial dysfunction is involved in uh, a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's. And so they're trying to find agonists to uh, turn on TREM2 um, to help promote microglial health in these diseases. They have an agonist antibody, which I thought was interesting, uh, but they also have a small molecule program looking for brain-penetrant TREM2 agonists for Alzheimer's disease. Um, one thing I should say about this is, uh, you know, the flavor of this, uh, not to knock on any of these companies, um, but as you can see, almost all of these assets were in-licensed, and uh, so it's not the most scientifically interesting cohort, but I think that just reflects the market where the really interesting, you know, new technologies, the hot, sexy stuff, you know, they were able to raise so much money in the private markets that they haven't needed to go public, and I think now uh, many of those companies, as we'll see, are sort of sitting and waiting until the IPO window opens again. Um, so speaking of big private raises, uh, there were three in particular I thought were interesting scientifically. Uh, Septerno raised $100 million in their Series A, uh, just launched in South San Francisco. Icon raised a whopping half billion dollar Series B uh, from a group of a lot of investors which is crazy. And they also recruited you know, former Merck head of R&D as their CEO. I think they have Ken Frazier on their board of directors, You know, sort of a star-studded cast. Um, actually, my first boss in industry uh, is a VP of chemistry there now, uh, which I thought is cool, small world. Um, and finally, LifeMine is another company co-founded by Greg Verdeen. And they raised about uh, $175 million in their Series C. Um, Septerna uh, is targeting GPCRs, um, and this is interesting because you know, GPCRs are a very old target class, you know, highly considered highly druggable. But what's not appreciated is actually of all the universe of GPCRs, um, only a fraction of them have been drugged. Additionally, with GPCRs, there's been a lot more nuanced understanding of the biology of GPCR signaling, where um, you know it's known that GPCRs can signal and have different activities. Um, depending on whether they signal through the G proteins or through arrestins. And so in the last couple of years, there was a lot of interest in trying to find biased agonists, for example. So with the mu opioid receptor, people were trying to figure out, can you, you know, selectively make it so that you only signal through uh, the mu opioid receptors arrestin pathway to prevent, you know, the side effects or addiction phenomenon of um, opioid drugs. And there are obviously, you know, for, for the universe of other GPCRs, there are a lot of different ways you can modulate that biology beyond just finding inhibitors or pure agonists. The, the technical sort of innovations here are really cool. So um, uh, Septerno is co-founded by Robert Lefkowitz, Nobel Prize winner at Stanford. Um, and one of the developments in this area is people have been able to isolate individual GPCRs in ternary complexes in these nano, lipid nanodisks. So you get a single GPCR in sort of a little lipid bubble that's wrapped around like a tostada with a protein, a protein wrapper. And by isolating these things, you can now characterize them by cryo-EM structurally uh, or screen them using tools like DEL. Um, you know, one of the big challenges with GPCRs has always been isolating them biochemically because they're membrane proteins, really hard to get, you know, pure and in a relevant form. And so, you know, this innovation could enable not just new screening mechanisms and, you know, new structural insights, but also allow people to screen specifically for, you know, different activities on GPCRs. So I think we'll see a lot of interesting biology come out of this space and will take time, but it's a company to watch. 
Icon is taking a couple cool technologies and putting them together. One is super resolution microscopy, which also won a Nobel Prize recently. Uh, Eric Betzig, one of the Nobel Prize winners in chemistry, um, or maybe it was physics, uh, now I can't remember. Um, but he is one of the co-founders of this company. And if you haven't gone and Googled super resolution microscopy or looked at some of these videos, it is crazy the kind of images that they're able to generate. You can see individual nerves with like the skeletons of the nerves and how you know things are uh, moving along. If you check out uh, Xiaowei Zhuang's storm images, um, her lab's at Harvard, uh, it's, it's beautiful and it's really mind blowing. You should go check it out. They're combining this with another, you know, sort of um, hot technology in the last couple of years, single particle tracking, where also using new imaging and processing techniques, you can follow, you know, dye labeled individual proteins in a cell. So you can see how, you know, receptors, uh, you know, aggregate on different organelles, where they're going. And so by combining these two things, you can get you know, higher resolution into what exactly is going on in a cell when you apply a drug or do some sort of genetic manipulation or something like that. Um, you know, right now, in the way we do a lot of uh, you know, PD or you know, the way we do assays is kind of you grind up all the cells and then you just sort of see what level of expression there is. You know, this can let you see changes where maybe the total protein you know, expression or something like that isn't changing. Uh, but you can see changes in the distribution of targets and things like that. They've been able to um, make this high throughput so they can do high throughput screening with super resolution single particle tracking. And so again, this is a platform that I think we'll see a lot of interesting new biology come out of. And it'll probably take you know, time to find drugs since they're going to have to look through a lot of different mechanisms, but it's definitely a place to watch for new publications. Finally, LifeMind. Um, they are working on, uh, there's not a lot disclosed about them, but they're working in the theme of fungal natural product-based drug discovery. Um, this is pretty interesting because uh, molecular glues, molecules that stick more than one protein together to exert some function have been, you know, super, super interesting recently, both for degradation and inhibition. Um, and a lot of the initial glues like rapamycin were derived from natural products that are either fungal derived or bacterial natural products that act on fungal proteins that turned out to also act on human proteins. So their pitch is, well, if you can you know, find a really high throughput way to screen for you know, fungal natural products that act on fungi, you might be able to find human targets and uh, molecules that are starting points for modulating human proteins that are difficult to drug otherwise. Um, this glue-based strategy is really great for targeting, you know, PPIs, right, where there's not a great, you know, surface for one molecule to bind, but if you can bring two proteins together, and, uh, you know, then you could potentially find some interesting new chemical matter. The most famous uh, glue molecules, uh, you know, like rapamycin um, or cyclosporin, you know, they bind to proteins like uh, calcineurin or FKBP, um, and then they take this protein and they stick it onto another protein and that's how they um, you know, inhibit their targets like mTOR. I think Revolution Medicines most recently is the probably the most well-known recent application of this where they were able to take um, a natural product scaffold derived from warp drive bio, uh, which they acquired, which was also a company founded by Greg Verdeen. And they were able to stick that molecule onto KRAS and uh, irreversibly inhibit KRAS. So, um, I think if you can expand this to a lot of other kinds of targets, that would be very exciting. GSK paid $70 million upfront to partner with them. That's a pretty significant amount in the partnership for cash upfront. Um, and they also participated in their Series C investment round. GSK has uh, had a pretty strong track record of, you know, acquiring and developing assay technology. I think most famously, they were one of the first to acquire a company doing Dell screening and bring it in-house. Um, so they were pioneers there. So if they like something in screening, um, that's a good sign for life. All right. Can't talk about technology without talking about AI and machine learning. Um, there are you know, at least you know, 16 companies with major news events from the last couple months. So I'm not going to go into huge detail about all of them. We will be publishing an article on this. So if you do want to read more in detail about this, you can uh, stay tuned for that. Um, but there are a couple broad themes that I wanted to touch on. One is that, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about, oh, 
you know, AI and machine learning, it's, there's all this hype. Uh, all these companies are trying to replace drug discovery scientists by, you know, sticking an algorithm in a computer and, uh, you know, throwing a training set at it and, you know, out pops a drug. But when you actually look at all of these companies, there's a lot more nuance to it. I think each of them are focused on a different aspect of drug discovery, uh, taking different data sets and, you know, enriching them to give us more value added information. Some of them are trying to do drug discovery and trying to, you know, do medicinal chemistry with generative design and things like that. Um, but there's really a broad range of applications for where AI and machine learning can be helpful. Uh, one of the ones I thought was particularly cool was recursion. So, you know, image processing is one of the most well-known voice and image processing, one of the most well-known applications of, you know, uh, machine learning, uh, things like Siri, right? Um, Google Images, uh, Tesla, you know, uh, all of these sort of image, image or voice recognition things um, use this. And so, you know, what they're doing is applying this to uh, phenotype mapping. So when you look at a cell, right, there's the same problem of, well, typically we maybe do a Western blot, do some kind of staining. We look for one marker on a protein or one marker on the cell. And that's how we decide if the cell is, you know, a T cell or a B cell or something like that. If you worked in immunology or immuno-oncology or something like that, you know now that um, cells are much more diverse than uh, you know, CD4 positive or um, you know, Th17 cells, right? Uh, you can have exhausted T cells, you can have um, you know, exhausted fibroblasts, you, you can have all sorts of different cells that are all kind of the same uh, lineage but uh, have different you know, behaviors or activities or, or things like that. And so to help get better resolution on you know, what drugs are doing to cells um, or even just the biology of, uh, of a tissue like in cancer or in inflamed tissue, they are able to use image processing to, you know, so now they can label, for example, six different targets with six different dye colors, put that through and you know, analyze all the cells in a mixture and then use AI and machine learning to extract from that data and say, you know, what sort of patterns our cells are in this mixture of 10 or 12 different cell types and, you know, really assess changes in biology that way. So again, in the theme of the previous uh, companies as well, you know, I think this is going to help bring new insights into biology, um, you know, for new targets that we can drug or, or at least find better places where we can put existing drugs where we might not fully appreciate the biology right now. Um, you know, another theme is that these companies are finally starting to put molecules into the clinic. It's still very early. And so not to knock on any of these companies, but, you know, if you're doing drug discovery and you're looking at these targets like, you know, TREC or HDAC or MEC12, you know, it's not the most impressive stuff in the world yet. Um, but we'll have to give it some time and see, uh, you know, whether new targets can emerge from this or as the molecules are disclosed. Um, you know, what sort of leaps these can actually help in help with in medicinal chemistry. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but again, uh, if you want to know more about all these other companies, um, they're all doing, you know, different stuff. Uh, we'll have an article on that shortly. Finally, um, you know, I'm going to take a contrarian opinion here. I think, you know, people have all been saying, oh, you know, AI machine learning, it's a bubble, you know, it's crazy. There's so much money going into it. And that might be the impression that you get from reading the news, like endpoints or stats or whatever, um, you know, where they sort of hype up these total deal values. Um, but if you look at the deals, actually, of the $17 billion in total deal volume last year, only $540 million of that was upfront. Um, now, we just saw one company, Icon, raise basically that amount in a single financing round. Um, and so pharma is not actually putting that much cash into these things. A lot of these are milestone based, pegged to, you know, well, can you actually find a drug using uh, AI and machine learning? Um, so $3.3 3 billion were invested um, into AI and machine learning companies. And so that's also not a crazy number, right? So if, if pharma is paying up, you know, half a billion dollars in a year for partnership activities, this is like a 6x revenue multiple. So, you know, it's not like the 100x or 200x revenue multiples you sometimes see in software startups. So 
I think, you know, I think this area is interesting. I think there's good reason to be excited about it. I don't think it's been super crazy, even though it's been in the news a lot. And I think there will be interesting stuff to come out of this. Now, one frustration, though, is I really hope that the AI geniuses at Apple or Google can figure out how to transcribe Drug Hunter, because every time I do a transcript of one of these webinars for my notes, or if I text somebody, Drug Hunter gets transcribed into something crazy. I've seen Drunk Hunter, Dragon Hunter. I don't even know how, I mean, you know, do I pronounce drug funny or something? Um, anyway, I hope somebody can fix that soon. All right, uh, for startups, there were, uh, again, I won't talk about all of these in detail. Um, one modality that's again been trending is molecular glues. Ambigon, I thought was particularly interesting. It came out of a partnership with uh, Michelle Arkin's lab and her collaborators. Uh, what they found is uh, 14, so 1433 is the scaffolding protein that brings, it's an anchor for different proteins to interact with each other. Uh, most famously, I think it's involved in RAF dimer formation, where two RAF molecules will sit on 1433 together and, um, you know, do their signaling once they're, uh, you know, both bound in this complex. The 1433 is an adapter protein, so it interacts with, you know, right now at least 3,000 interaction partners have been characterized. So, you know, the idea here is, well, if you could use this as a platform for molecular glues, if you can find something that binds to 1433 and other partners, you could potentially have starting points for thousands of different targets. Obviously, it's you know not not that straightforward. You still have to find the molecules that do this. Um, but the exciting development is that you know the Arkin Lab with uh, their collaborators through fragment-based screening, also using tethering, um, which was the, also the strategy used to find KRAS uh, starting points. Um, they were able to find some hits that uh, appear to glue molecules to 1433. Their most advanced program is still in hit to lead, so they still need to optimize these. It's not clear that these are going to be, you know, drug-like molecules yet, um, but this is definitely an area to watch. Um, another theme among modalities in companies getting financing are um, targeting non-protein targets. So RNA targeting drugs, DNA targeting drugs, um, and even tRNA drugs. Um, next RNA is focused on small molecules targeting long non-coding RNAs. So there are lots of you know, RNAs that are expressed where you know, they don't actually get transcribed into protein, but they do play important roles in you know, binding to other proteins and regulating the transcription of the portions of RNA that are transcribed. So uh, you could, if you can find small molecule modulators of those proteins, you could potentially drug, you know, targets that are not easy to drug directly um, through the protein. You might be able to target their expression somehow indirectly. Uh, Design Therapeutics is working on gene tax uh, or gene targeted small molecule recruiters. So they have uh, like Protax, they have uh, one function that binds to DNA and then another portion of the molecule that recruits um, some other protein involved in transcription. So they can target the DNA and then bring along, you know, a protein that allows that gene to be transcribed or stop that gene from being transcribed. Molecules are not the most beautiful things in the world. You can see the molecule at the top. You know, they've got these polyheterocyclic polyamides that, you know, are not going to be uh, great for getting into cells, um, you know, or for, for other properties. But they do have an IV clinical candidate um, in phase one for Friedrich ataxia. So um, we'll keep a close eye on those. Uh, tRNA drugs, I thought this was pretty cool. Um, so a lot of genetic diseases are caused by... Um, premature stop codons. So you normally have a protein that's supposed to get transcribed um, with some point mutations. Instead of coding the correct amino acid, it switches into an early stop codon. And so when you're transcribing this protein, it hits that stop, and then you have a you know, dysfunctional protein. What they're trying to do is take tRNA and uh, engineer it so that it can bind to these stop codons and insert a correct codon instead. Now, uh, you know, probably 10, 20 years ago, I would have said, oh, this sounds like science fiction. How are you going to get tRNA, you know, into, into the nucleus and um, actually do this stuff? Um, but now with all these new drugs like Rizdaplam, where, you know, even a small molecule can, you know, influence uh, splicing selectively such that, you know, an SMN misfolded protein can, that you can get enough of healthy transcript there. I mean, you know, now, now I'll believe almost anything. So, uh, 
and I'm really excited to see uh, if proof of concept can be achieved there. Other modalities, um, so cell therapies, everybody's heard of CAR T's, right? You're engineering T cells to attack cancer cells uh, or something like that. Um, well, new trend is engineering cells as protein factories. So B cells are the cells that produce antibodies normally. And so walking fish is trying to engineer B cells to produce uh, various proteins, cytokines, chemokines, um, um, antibodies, you name it. Now, the interesting thing about this approach is with antibodies, you know, you're not doing it, you don't have any sort of inherent tissue selectivity. But B cells, um, you can program tissue selectivity into B cells. That's how B cells know to, you know, through chemotaxis and uh, other things, they know to go to sites of infection or um, things like that. And so if you could engineer B cells to bring your protein, you know, specifically to a tumor or to an inflamed tissue or something like that, maybe you would have a better effect with some of these biologic drugs. Avenge Bio is taking a, a different approach with polymer encapsulated cells. And so they're just injecting cells that are encapsulated in the polymer to keep them at a site uh, where they want them to make drugs like IL-2. Um, IL-2 is a molecule that everybody has been, you know, trying to find some form of to make more uh, selective um, so that you don't get cytokine storm or whatever uh, when you administer it. And so using cells uh, that are trapped in a certain tissue to produce and deliver this is an interesting approach. Finally, pretzel therapeutics, um, which is named after the shape of mitochondria, uh, not like the rolled gold folded pretzels, but like the, the rod pretzels, the chunky German ones. Um, uh, they are focused on treating mitochondrial diseases by targeting uh, mitochondrial DNA. So uh, most people know the nucleus, you have your, uh, you know, your 23 chromosomes or whatever, but um, in the mitochondria, you also have DNA that's inherited from uh, your mom. Um, and a lot of genetic diseases are related to mitochondrial dysfunction. So two innovations here. One is uh, uh, David Liu's lab in 2020 uh, published in Nature um, this bacterial toxin that gets into cells and nicks DNA and makes these changes. Uh, a year later, one of the co-founders of Pretzel found that they could engineer that enzyme to specifically target mitochondrial DNA and deliver that into cells with a viral vector. So, um, you know, it's cool to see this bacterial toxin be sort of reapplied to, uh, you know, editing mitochondrial DNA. Um, but they also have a small molecule program uh, where uh, two of the other co-founders, they had been screening for small molecule inhibitors of mitochondrial DNA transcription, and they did find some hits that were also published in Nature two years ago. Uh, so that was pretty cool. So it's conceivable that you could also screen for activators of some kind or correctors. So another theme to watch. Finally, um, here are just six of the biggest partnerships that were announced in the first quarter. And you can see that uh, they're all focused on, you know, a couple key modalities, RNA degraders, RNA processing modulators, you know, molecular glues, uh, non-cysteine covalence and transcription factor modulators. Uh, for anyone working in the industry, this is probably not a surprise. These are areas of high interest and have been areas of high interest for the last few years. Um, uh, but it'll be interesting to see if different approaches emerge from these companies. All right, so in this last section, we'll talk about um, moving targets, uh, targets where there's been new clinical data um, or something to change our thinking. So Gilead, uh, Gilead's CD47 molecule was a big deal. Um, everybody was spooked uh, in you know, February or March when uh, Gilead had a clinical hold placed, a partial clinical hold placed on their CD47 antibody. Uh, because they paid $5 billion for it uh, in their acquisition of the startup 47. I got like, you know, I got several calls from investors asking like, why, you know, what's, what's wrong with it? Is this toxicity, you know, is this on target? You know, what's, what's going on? Um, but there was recent news that that partial clinical hold has been lifted. You know, the reason hasn't been disclosed, but it seems like it's proceeding. So everybody can calm down. Um, it's still, still going. It had really exciting efficacy in early trials, and that's why everybody's super excited about it. That's why they paid $5 billion for it. There's not a lot of great treatments for AML or MDS. Um, AML is an absolutely horrible disease. Um, and so if 
I really hope I really hope this works as well um, in later trials as it did in the beginning. Um, other news that uh, news outlets kind of sensationalized was that oral SIRDs didn't improve for progression-free survival in late cancers. Um, so these are molecules like on the right. We featured two of them in molecules of the month uh, in the last couple of years, um, Sanofi's uh, degrader and Genentex degrader. These molecules selectively degrade the estrogen receptor. Um, and uh, the innovation here is that these are oral drugs. The previous estrogen degrader, uh, tamoxifen, um, or sorry, fulvestrin, um, it's injectable. And the thesis there was that it doesn't get sufficient target coverage for you to see full activity. Um, and so this doesn't appear to be playing out in these late stage cancers in ER positive metastatic breast cancer. Um, they don't appear to be improving survival um, over, um, over standard care. But uh, you know, another angle for these that I think is the big opportunity is in the adjuvant setting when you know the breast cancer is not as you know serious, but you're trying to prevent it from relapsing. Safety and tolerability and convenience is really an issue because those breast cancer patients they want to get on with their lives. They don't you know want to be taking injections and having you know worrying about things all the time. Um, and so the adjuvant and first line trials for these drugs are still going on. If they work there, these are still potential blockbusters. So I think we need to keep watching this space. Finally, Tigit, uh, there was big news in the first quarter that it didn't improve progression-free survival in small cell lung cancer. Um, you know, this spooked people because Tigit was supposed to be the next cancer immunotherapy uh, or checkpoint um, mechanism to be approved for cancer immunotherapy. But small cell lung cancer has always been kind of a high bar uh, for immunotherapy. Um, you don't see as good responses even with PD-1 in, in this group. So it wasn't too surprising that you didn't see an effect in, uh, in this group. Now, bigger news is in the last two days, uh, Genentech announced that their phase three and non-small cell lung cancer also didn't improve survival. And that's a big deal because, you know, non-small cell lung cancer is kind of, you know, the bread and butter of where PD-1 does work. Um, and so uh, failing there is uh, not a great sign for the mechanism. Hey, Dennis, I think it's time for a poll. Oh, thank you. I forgot. Uh, okay, great. Um, do I need to switch that on on my end? Nope, Spencer's nope. going to do it. Okay, cool. All right, sorry, I totally skipped through that. So we were talking about modalities uh, in the last section. I was supposed to ask a poll uh, for all of you to tell us what you're most excited about. So Spencer will go ahead and turn that on, and I think you can vote using your Zoom panel. Okay, there, there's a pop-up. Okay, so which of the following areas are you most excited about? Targeted protein degradation, targeting RNA and DNA, AI and machine learning in drug discovery or molecular glues. Can you see how many responses are coming in, Spencer? Or is there any way to? Yeah, we can see that um, when everybody answers the poll, we'll be able to have those analytics. We are not allowed to vote as the host uh, and panelists though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just reading your chat now. I see you, uh, all the reminders about poll, poll, poll. Thanks, guys. <laughs> but Kevin says he can't see the poll. Um, can anybody see the poll in the chat? Yeah, we've had about 76% of people vote. <clears throat> so I'm not sure why Kevin can't see it, but most of the people have voted. Um, I can tell you what the results are right now if you'd like to hear what they are. Okay, um, sure. Uh, yeah, how do you switch on the results? Can you do that on your end? I can see them on my side because I'm the host. I don't know if you can see them, but I can read them off. We have about 33% of people who voted for targeting RNA and DNA, 28% of people for AI, ML, and drug discovery. 23% for target protein degradation, and then 15% for molecular glues. And I can put them in the chat. Awesome. Interesting. Well, I would have voted for molecular glues, so I guess uh, I'm the loser here. <laughs> but yeah, these are very exciting areas. Um, and uh, yeah, we should all stay tuned for what's coming next. 
Okay. Uh, I'm still sharing my screen, right? You are. Okay. All right. Is my presentation yeah. continuing now? Okay. All right. Last two slides, um, or last couple slides, sorry. Uh, moving targets in immunology. Um, Alumis's TIC2 inhibitor is going into phase one for psoriasis. Alumis is renamed from Esker Therapeutics. They are trying to have a best in class allosteric TIC2 inhibitor. And uh, uh, so far as we know, the structure is related to BMS's uh, phase three molecule, ducretinib. Um, we're, I think the industry is pretty convinced that uh, ducretinib is not only going to get approved, but is going to be a huge blockbuster um, because it's safer. It's as efficacious as many biologics, but is safer than JAK inhibitors for inflammatory diseases. So uh, the interesting backstory here is Nimbus had the front runner, uh, you know, tick allosteric tick, tick two molecule after ducretinib, ducrobatinib. Um, but, Nim but Nimbus had a partnership with Celgene. And as everybody knows, BMS acquired Celgene for other reasons. Um, and so once they acquired Celgene, BMS really had no incentive to develop Nimbus's molecule because they already had, you know, this, uh, this leader um, in phase three. So um, this was in the news last year, you know, Nimbus sued BMS saying this was, um, you know, an anti-competitive, monopolistic, et cetera. They recently dropped their lawsuit, uh, but this has created an opening for another best-in-class allosteric inhibitor to catch up. And so... Um, Esker or Alamis has raised a lot of money to develop this, and um, uh, it seems like uh, if they can be if they can be quick, there might be an opportunity there. Ventus closed a hundred forty million dollars Series C to focus on a virtual screening platform uh, called Resol. Uh, they their pipeline projects are focused on NLRP three. They have preclinical molecules that are either peripherally restricted NLRP3 inhibitors for inflammation, inflammation, liver or kidney diseases, and they have a brain penetrant program uh, for Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So it's an interest, you know, NLRP3, that whole pathway has been a hot area of interest. Um, so it's interesting to see them continuing to develop this, but also um, this technology platform uh, in the future. KIT, so third har harmonic bio raised over $100 million to develop a KIT molecule. Uh, I thought this was interesting because most people know KIT from oncology. Uh, I think imatinib, one of the serendipitous targets that it hit in addition to BCR able was CKIT. And so um, I want to say it's uh, CKIT activity was really important for its approval, its second approval in GIST, these gastrointestinal tumors. Um, but outside of oncology, uh, KIT hasn't really been explored too much with small molecules. Um, you know, in inflammation, right, you need, there's a much higher bar for safety than in oncology. And so taking kinase inhibitor into different indications there uh, is challenging. Um, but what they're doing is taking a more selective KIT inhibitor um, into mast cell driven inflammatory diseases because KIT is kind of this master signaling molecule uh, driving mast cells. Oh, I should mention, the main indication, you know, speaking of safety, the main indication they're going into is chronic urticaria, which is this itching problem that is common in uh, certain young women. And, you know, that's an especially high bar for safety because, you know, itching is, you know, th this indication is really awful and insufferable. Uh, but obviously if you're a young woman and you may become pregnant in the next couple of years, right, you definitely, if you're taking a kinase inhibitor, you definitely want it to be safe. So uh, interesting play there. Uh, finally, in CV, Afficamptin is moving into phase three. This is cytokinetics cardiac myosin inhibitor. Uh, it's dosed 5, 10, or 15 megs orally once daily. And it is uh, second after Mavicamptin, which was the molecule acquired by BMS for $13 billion from uh, myocardia, another San Francisco or Bay Area company. Um, the cytokinetics molecule was designed to be potentially safer with a, a lower peak to trough or better, uh, better PK because at higher concentrations, um, this can cause, uh, this mechanism appears to cause cardiac failure. And so they're threading this needle for um, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
Uh, what I thought was interesting about this is both cytokinetics and myocardia had um, uh, James Spudick, uh, a professor at Stanford, as a co-founder. So uh, his two companies are competing against each other. Uh, so it's always great for patients. Last two programs are for pain. Atogapant uh, had a positive readout in phase three. It prevents migraine, so it can be used for prevention, not just acute treatment of migraine. This is huge for migraine patients because it's, you know, nobody wants to have migraines. And if you can take a pill safely that, you know, prevents these really horrible heart uh, headaches, that would be awesome. Uh, for the last couple of years, CGRP had been a target mainly for biologics. People had injectable antibodies against um, CGRP for to stop these really painful acute migraines. But obviously for treating headaches, you don't want to take an injection, you want an oral molecule. So Biohaven's Neurotech was the first that was approved specifically for treatment of acute migraine. And uh, you know, that was also in the news recently because Pfizer just bought Biohaven for you know, over $10 billion or something like that. I mean, this is going to be a CGRP is a huge franchise. Um, but ZAPV molecule uh, could become best in class and effectively by enabling prevention of migraine um, could potentially make these biologics obsolete. So this is a huge win for small molecules after decades of development. Um, you know, I just have to emphasize how high of a bar this was for medicinal chemistry. I mean, if you look at that molecule on the right, this doesn't look, I mean, it's got like seven, eight rings. It does not look like a drug that was easy to make orally once daily and safe. Um, and safe is the key word here because what stopped early molecules like Merck's clinical candidates were unexpected liver tox. So, uh, you know, obviously to treat pain, which is a high bar for safety and to, to give it chronically for prevention, um, you need a really, really high quality molecule. So this appears to be checking all the boxes. Finally, uh, most recently, uh, Vertex had a positive proof of concept trial in phase two for acute pain. Um, basically, it was based on a subjective score after surgeries. They have a NAV 1.8 inhibitor uh, that appears to show efficacy orally here. Um, and this is really exciting because you know, NAV 1.7 and other sodium channel inhibitors had been explored for pain, but NAV 1.7 was this huge disappointment because nobody could see efficacy, even though it was so genetically validated. Um, this is kind of uh, bringing interest back into this space um, because they do seem to be seeing efficacy in, you know, in a different population. So they seem to be bringing this forward. The structure has not been disclosed, but it's likely related to their previous pro-drug um, whose structure is on the bottom right. Right. How are we on time? Okay. Um, so uh, hopefully you found this helpful, even though there weren't too many structures. Uh, if you enjoyed this, you should consider asking your company to sign up for a premium subscription. Um, we cover a lot more than what you see on the free version. So for Molecules of the Month, for example, we put out monthly slide decks where we go through deep dives of the industry context for each molecule, why they're important, if there's any clinical data, how the hits were found, uh, et cetera. We have site searchable case studies. We do this for drug approvals as well. Every month with the new drug approvals, we explain why they're important. We explain you know, how they were found. We do annual reviews by indication. We're now covering new things like IPOs, M&A, why these IPOs are important, the science behind these companies, all the things that you will not get from journals that you will not find in news outlets. We explain events. Why did GSK acquire this JAK inhibitor? Why are these trial, trial readouts important? We cover, we're covering new technology now. Uh, what are these platforms? How are they different from what's already been done? Emerging modalities. And we're constantly rolling out new things like events and, and other perks. Um, so uh, one, uh, one head of R&D at a large pharma company told us this saves her days, if not weeks of reading each month. Um, and so far the feedback from all of our subscribers has been along similar lines. These are just some snapshots of single slides from these slide decks that we put out. Uh, you can't read them on these slides, but it's just to give you a feel for the depth of information that we go into. These are not just summaries of papers. These are you know, full literature and industry reviews on clinical trials, news, um, everything that you sort of need to know in a couple minutes over coffee. Um, and uh, because we just launched premium a few months ago, we had been promoting a discounted first year price where you can get pretty much everybody on your team for five or more people for $29 per month per person. Uh, because we've rolled out so many new features, including this industry coverage, we are going to be discontinuing this launch price soon. 
So if you think your team or company might be interested in this, please get in touch with us um, and we'd be happy to do a demo for you um, and convince your manager why this will actually save your company a lot of money and a lot of time. Uh, other premium subscribers work at companies like AbbVie, GSK, Merck, Sanofi, Borgner Ingelheim, uh, you know, major life science investors like Arch Venture Partners, Third Rock, RE Capital, GP, um, uh, so on and so forth, and a lot of biotech. So, um, so far, it's been working out pretty well. Um, uh, so please get in touch if you think that's something that would help you. Um, thanks to our team, and let's open it up for questions. We do have a few questions. Okay, so first one um, by more than one person. Can you repeat the date for the event in Cambridge? And is there a location yet? Uh, October 19th is the tentative date. Um, yeah, we're still working on finding the or finalizing the venue. Most likely it's going to be at the Mass Bio Center in Kendall Square. Um, but send us an email and we will you know, let you know when we have updates. Okay, uh, next question. Have you ever heard anything about uh, Merodian? Meroidin? Meroidin. Doesn't ring a bell. Hmm. Okay, well, that's a short answer. Um, <laughs> next question then. Um, if the AI ML learning systems were found uh, efficient enough by the drug companies, would the FDA or drug administration authorities let the companies use the systems in the drug development process um, as a decision maker or, or a pathfinder? You know, I'm sure they would just like any other, you know, any other statistical process, right? Um, I think it just has to be validated with data. Um, you know, the FDA has actually been really open about, you know, for example, PKPD modeling or um, uh, uh, P PBPK modeling for predicting human PK, you know, with, um, with different molecules and things like that. So, um, you know, I'm sure it won't be easy, but, um, you know, the FDA is actually a very progressive government body. I, I'm biased, but I want to say the FDA is probably the most innovative and progressive government body that we have in the United States. Um, not that it's ever easy to, to do things in regulatory affairs, but um, I'm optimistic that we'll see more of that in the next couple of years. Great. Okay, another question. In drug discovery, what would you say is the most important factor and why? A, determining the mechanisms in the disease state that can be inhibited or manipulated, or B, synthesizing and extracting the ligands to be used as drugs. Yeah, easy, easy answer there. Disease mechanisms, biology. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it all starts with biology and what these drugs actually do. Um, yeah, there's lots of good compounds that, uh, you know, haven't progressed and never will progress just because, you know, the biology doesn't play out. So. There you go. Okay, the appetite for funding of new creative science seems to be at an all-time high. Uh, what are your thoughts? Is it too much, too little, just right? I think it's exciting. You know, I mean, I think, you know, we go through these, these cycles, right, where there's a ton of investor enthusiasm and then there's not a lot of enthusiasm. I think you know, COVID was kind of this white swan for the industry where everybody panicked and they were like, oh God, where do we put our money? Healthcare, you know? And, and so you had this kind of big, big balloon inflate. Um, and, and now that's just unwinding. Um, but, you know, I think fundamentally the innovations and the value creation is there. Um, you know, healthcare right now is this, you know, it's 17% or more, I think 20% or more of the US economy. It's like a trillion, multi-trillion dollar um, effort. And I think, you know, new drug discovery technologies are a great way to save society money because, you know, people complain about how much drugs cost, for example. But have you looked at a hospital bill for a surgery? I mean, if you can prevent one surgery, right, with a drug, that's saving society a ton of money. Um, so, yeah, I think there are still tons of ways that we can save society money with new innovations. Um, and given the size of the healthcare problem, I, I don't see that changing. Okay. Um, and the last question is, did you hear about Watson IBM predicted therapies that were dangerous, not effective and incorrect? And if so, thoughts? I don't remember if this was IBM. Um, don't quote me on this, but I thought, wasn't there like a new story that IBM, like it was kind of a Wizard of Oz thing where it didn't really work, but it was mostly marketing. Um, 
I could be wrong. I mean, somebody who specializes in AI and machine learning in the audience can probably give a more informed answer uh, than me, but yeah. Any other questions? Feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A box. Um, we have a comment that uh, Lefkowitz is at Duke. Um, I believe that Thanks, was a Chris. reference. Yeah. yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I misspoke. I, I'm I went to Stanford and I was a Stanford chemistry graduate, so I was just thinking I was thinking Brian Kabilko when I said uh, Lefkowitz. Um, I was also thinking about um, uh, what's his name, um, James Spudic. Um, so I got those mixed up. Thank you. Good. One more question. Um, can medicinal chemists take part in determining mechanisms of action of disease states, or is it limited to other professionals? Um, and if, if so, can you name those professionals? Oh, absolutely. I mean, medicinal chemists should always be, okay. Um, one thing I should say is, you know, the reason why the site is called Drug Hunter is because a drug hunter can be anybody, right? It can be a medicinal chemist, it can be a process chemist, it could be a biologist, it could be a doctor, it could be a business person, right? I think what a drug hunter does is they try to take things that have effects on biology and make them useful for humans. So if you're in any role, whether it's pharmacology or chemistry or you know uh, computational biology, um, you can call yourself a drug hunter if you're trying to figure out how to make a drug useful in humans. I, one of the things I, you know, could talk for days about, and we have several articles on this, uh, Kim Heward has a great interview on this called Don't, Don't Work on Things That Don't Work. Every person on the project team should be thinking about these problems and contributing to them. If you're the chemist, you know, if you want to grow in your career or have more of an impact on drug discovery, you have to be thinking about how can you use your expertise to help the team solve the big questions, which are, is this, you know, number one, is this target a target we should be working on? And two, how will we know? Um, Great answer. Okay. I think that's about it. Cool. Well, I think we're just at time anyway. So uh, thank you everybody for coming. It's great to see many of you again and uh, stay tuned for the next one. Take care.